This is the Ruckus and the Menace Sports Podcast. Oh no! We suck again! I'm getting confused. What game are you calling? I'm calling both games! It is caught by Kelsey! Touchdown! Kansas City! Anthony for three! Bang! How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? You are listening to the Ruckus and the Menace Sports Podcast, episode number 86. I'm Spanish the Menace. And I'm Ruckus, always Cosmo Ruckus. And on this episode of the podcast, we will have in our starting lineup some moves in a in the MLB and the and a couple in the NBA. The good, the bad, and the ugly. We recap Championship Week that happened yesterday afternoon at the time of recording. And we question the Eliminated like we normally would in the high heat. We break down all the hires from all the hires that went on this past over the past couple of weeks. Some of them we've already mentioned and we'll go into a little bit more depth into. And then some of these were more recent hirings or hirings that happened in between the last episode. We break them down in our color commentary. We have no film room this week as we are gearing up for the Super Bowl showdown. And and I will give one small teaser. Next week is going to be huge. We get right into our stun dud to close out. And we are all set for this episode to begin. And Ruckus, why don't we get right into it in kind of talking about some of the major baseball moves that have happened. Most notably, a good amount of free agent acquisitions. Yep. um, So this one kind of hit me by surprise a little bit from the Royals as they signed a infielder. And a lot of people were saying that this could be a rumor that uh, we might be trading some people to try to get another closer. I really don't have a damn clue what's going on with the Royals right now. All I know is we're signing a lot of people, and this is kind of a, a bit of a surprise to me because we haven't done that like like this in a large scale in a while. Um, but uh, that was a good signing, I believe. Uh, Hector Neris to the Chicago Wait, Cubs. You didn't even so, mention you. Didn't, you went through all that and did not even mention the player by name. What Adam Frazier? Yeah, you you totally skipped it. Well, my bad, Spenis. Uh, <laughs> it is Adam Oral, Frazier to the Royals, and uh, former and also. Or... Here's a notable thing. I believe he also is a little bit more of a utility guy as well, because I think he's also played some outfield before. I think he specializes primarily at second base, but I believe he may also have a little bit of outfield experience. I'm I'm debating on whether or not I'm like a I'm mixing up Adam Frazier and Brian Reynolds or kind of blending them together, but I think Adam Frazier also has played some corner outfield. Yeah, I don't know. I just think the former Oriole, now Royal, Adam Frazier, I think it's kind of a okay signing. Uh, but there was rumors. It, it's that... not. It actually is not a horrible. I'm not saying. I don't it's think bad. it's a horrible. Yeah, he actually is a second baseman and an outfielder, so he does have a little bit of outfield experience. So, so that is something to keep in mind with that signing that he may also move into the outfield occasionally and kind of it brings that extra versatility that you really as a baseball team need. All right, moving on Hector Neris to the Cubs as it kind of strengthens their both in a teensy bit, just a little bit. And then Jock Peterson to the rattlesnakes of the diamondbacks. Um, that one, I think, is a good one, especially it bolsters their outfield a tad bit, where Coleman Carroll's still your center fielder, and 
Uh, I, believe I think it's Gar more so a DH bolster. I think it's a DH bolster more Is than Gary anything Hill else. Still on the Diamondbacks? I don't. Or did don't he get believe... traded? Um, Lourdes Gurriel is, he is currently still with the Diamondbacks, according to baseball reference. Wait, didn't he get signed to a big-ass contract by the Diamondbacks during the um, win? Yes, I think he got extended. Yes, I think okay. he got extended. That's then, what's going on. Yeah, and then, um, speaking of the, uh, same division as the Diamondbacks, the Los Angeles Dodgers decided it was a good idea to say, sign James Paxton to their roster. I think this is an eh signing because he showed... It's good. another aging lefty that has a little bit more of an injury history than than the guy than one of the high-profile guys that they currently have on the free agent market and is still there. Clayton Kershaw. Uh, Clayton, Clayton Kershaw or... Even the more talented, uh, even the more talented with the curveball, uh, Julio Urias, or at least well, a little bit more Urias. movement on that curveball. But he has, but he has some issues all, all on his own that are. Let's just say he has trouble with the curve right now when it comes to legal troubles. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, James Paxton to the Dodgers, and then Aaron Hicks to the Los Angeles Angels. As yes, the Yankees still owe him some moolah, which is nineteen million. Nothing to sniff at. Um, this is another. This is another Orioles deflator, because he was with Baltimore and was actually performing pretty well. It ultimately led to that contract with Anaheim, but at the same time, I think that Baltimore has been very, very uncharacteristically quieter than what they should be. I mean, they probably have a bunch of smaller moves that it, that they've made and kind of slip under the radar. But they're not they're not making the splash. They're not making a huge splash, which they just need to for really after having such a after line. having such a no, but I'm saying after having such a great season last year, this past year, it almost sounds like that's a little bit alarming. And then on Friday, Reese Hoskins signed with the Brewers after the Phillies decide, oh, we're not going to keep you. Oh, we're going to yeah, hurt. He hurt himself. <laughs> And was out for a while, so it's like. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but then, but then I think Reese Hoskins became disposable because Bryce Harper is moving to first base because Bryce Harper's playing more first base. I feel like also Hoskins isn't as speedy when it comes down the bases too, so he couldn't use that either. Yeah. Oh and yeah, his, but he didn't he have a higher strikeout rate than Harper too. <sighs> I'm not 100% sure, but I think that the DH spot in Philadelphia was already filled with a with a home run or bust hitter anyway in Kyle Schwarber. So I think Hoskins could afford to be moved or or at least not resigned and the Brewers actually may be a decent spot for him. He was 25% uh, K percentage, by the way, in 2022. And then in... Uh, and that was on fan graphs. So, mm. we'll see. Um, but yeah, it, but, he was definitely better than Schwarber as far as that goes. <laughs> yeah, but the next major player involved is that Jorge Polanco headlines a five-player deal... That sends him to the Mariners. It this makes also... for a very makes for a very interesting situation in the middle infield because you already have JP Crawford there. But Jorge Polanco main advantage is, is that he does bat switch. You know, also it kind of reminds me of the time when the Royals had Alcides Escobar and Omar Infante on the same team. And they were just dishing it out left and right, throwing the ball across the diamond. 
That was yeah, didn't, those, those are interesting times, my guy. But wasn't that was, also right around the time when they also had a certain player that you call Paper Bones? Oh, Mondesi. Well, Mondesi was yeah. a lot was a lot a lot down the line in the future because Alcides and them were there after we traded Granky for some from some uh, prospects from Milwaukee, which included. Lorenzo Kane, Alcides Escobar, and I don't even remember the other guy. But point is, Alcides and company were there in the long run, and I think we got a trade for Infante from the Tigers, like in 2013-2014. So I think Alcides with Omar, with Moose, and Hosmer, that was a solid infield at the time. And I think that uh, J.P. Crawford is going to be that Alcides Escobar to uh, the second baseman, uh, which I'm assuming is going to be second baseman, uh, Jorge Polanco. But he could also play third or first or anywhere. But damn, that would be a nice infield for the Mariners. Yep. And then the last major MLB headline is the Hall of Fame. Joining Jim Leland in Cooperstown for this year's class is Adrian Beltre, the former starting quarterback of the University of Tennessee prior to Peyton Manning, Todd Helton, and Joe Maurer. And yes, Todd Helton was a football player before becoming the first baseman in Colorado. I I did not know until now. I mean, it makes sense because I saw a video of um, it was like Todd Helton hitting a home run in Cooper in a uh, Coors Field, and Peyton Manning was there, and I was like, okay, cool. Like they maybe they went to the same college or some shit, but yeah, is... they were co- Yep, it was the same college, and they were actually college teammates. And honestly, I think Todd Helton getting there in the Hall of Fame, especially for him going as a Colorado Rocky, is huge. Because that team does not have a lot of representation right now. And then Joe Maurer is a Minnesota twin. That's... That's... And that's Ma- legendary. Maurer was a great catcher. Maurer was a great catcher. Maurer was an uh, excellent that's, hitter. That, that's understating it. He was... A, he was legendary. Like... In my time as a young youth, I looked at Maurer and I hated him because, one, he could hit the ball anywhere. It didn't matter where you pitched the damn thing in the zone. He would hit it, and it was frustrating for me to play against him in MLB The Show. And it was also frustrating to see him get hit after hit after hit as a rival uh, team with the Royals. Like, come on, man. We sucked already. You don't need to make us suck even more. Anyways, oh, Maurer... Maurer is an excellent hitter. I've actually seen Joe Maurer play live. I think I saw him Fen- at one point at too. Fenway Park. At Fenway Park. Mm-hmm. And that for me, I think, made it it was a really good good day. I mean the twins won the game because Maurer had a huge hit. But Maurer was really good. Dude, I think I only really saw Maurer play live once, but I also got the uh, luxury to see Barry Zito in an A's uniform. That was interesting. I had, I had Ricky Hender. I actually did get to see Ricky Henderson, uh, Cal Ripken. Was that as a Met or as, as a A? Oakland. It was his uh nineteen ninety. It was like his late nineties stint as an A. Damn. Yep, his late 90s stint as an A. Um, same with uh, Cal Ripken as an Oriole. Got to see Cal Ripken at, twice. That would have been legendary to see him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there was one game where Ripken homered. Um, Big Al let's see. hitting dingers? Uh, Ripken had about 400 in his career. So, <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then Adrian Beltre, as long as nobody touches his head. <laughs> Gotta rub the yes. genie's head. To get <laughs> no. A wish. No, that was actually something that Adrian Beltre hated. 
Wasn't that something that Nelson Cruz did at one point or tried to do to Beltre whenever they were teammates on the Rangers? It it was Adrian Beltre hates when people rub his head, rubs his head. All right. Uh, so no, it was just you. That was the one thing that he never, that nobody really ever was like. Nobody should do that with him. It just remained a clubhouse joke. He actually was a member of the Red Sox, and but I think he was only there for twenty ten. I don't think he was there for extremely. Did he sign with the Mariners after the fact? Or was he originally a Mariner after getting traded by the Dodgers? I don't no, remember the whole. No, track. no, he went to. Uh, no, after 2010, when he went to Boston, he was a member of the Texas Rangers. Well, um, to... where was he originally at then? Because I remember him playing on the Mariners. He started out as a Dodger. Right, but after he was a Dodger, where did he go to the Mariners? Seattle. And then how long did he play with Seattle for? Five years. And then went to Boston. Was he was then Boston went to Boston for trade? one. Then went to Boston for one. Was that a uh, trade no, I for think a it was rental? a I think it was a free agent. Yeah. Okay. It was actually a free agent. Uh the twenty ten Red Sox. I think I I may or may not have seen this team. Um uh, because Clay Bulkholtz was there. Wait, Victor Jay Martinez. Drew. Wait. I don't even think we had Victor Martinez that long. I think Victor <laughs> Martinez went to the Tigers at that point. No, no, he had a stint in twenty ten. I think it was a he was a deadline deal to Boston in twenty ten. Um wasn't JD Drew still on the club around then too, or no? Or is he Yes, uh... JD Drew was there. Jason JD Drew was there. I think Tech yeah, uh Euclid was there. I think Veritech was there. No, the catcher was Victor Martinez, but I think Veritech got hurt. Oh, so Salto Lamakia probably came like two years after that. <sighs> Salto Lamakia Yeah, Jared Salta Lamakia came to the Red Sox, I think, a little later. Because wasn't but also Victorino that 2010... part of that 2013 team, too? Yes, Victorino was a part of that team. Uh, Johnny Gomes was a part of that team. Yep. Yeah, so that 2013 team had Dustin Pedroia, Shane Victorino, Jacoby Ellsbury, David Ortiz, Clay Buckholtz. Mike Napoli was a part of that team. Koji Uihara, Daniel Nava, Jared Salta Lamakia, Stephen Drew. So actually, both Drew brothers were a part of the twenty, or the Red Sox and winning. Uh, John Big Lester, Poppy. John John Locky yeah, was one of Poppy's final years. JBJ was there. Um, Jose Iglesias was there. Uh, Brock the Brock Star was there. Xander Bogarts was actually he Xander was Bogarts. No, actually no. It was during his, it was during his rookie year. It was actually his rookie year, or at least within the time frame of his rookie his rookie campaign. He played 118 game or no 18 games for the for the Red Sox in 2013, and I actually did get to see one of them. So I got mm. to see, so I did get to see Bogarts during his rookie year, and actually I did get to see Pedroia during his rookie year. Your version of Paper Bones, Pedroia. Actually, no. The laser show. The laser show was actually really good. It's just age. Age caught up to him with the injuries. His issue was more age that caused injuries more than anything else. 
I didn't hate that he was gone, like, so much due to injury. Because Pedroia was so serviceable. I mean, Rookie of the Year is first year, MVP is second year. And then really, throughout most of his career, was one of the best second basemen in the AL. Can't really complain too much. I just don't remember a whole lot about him. I just remember he was, like, pretty brittle near the end. Oh, yeah. But that comes with age. And now, I... since we're going to shift from baseball, we now shift to basketball with Commissioner Adam Silver of the NBA looking at an extension. But we had a hiring and firing in Milwaukee. As as the Milwaukee Bucks fired first-year head coach Adrian Griffin this past week. And his replacement? Glenn Doc Rivers. And yes, I went with the government because I had mentioned before in the podcast that I did that an old colleague of mine actually knew him by his actual name instead of Doc. So Do you know him for his raspy voice, too? <laughs> oh, Oh, the only reason why he knew him was because because Rivers was at Marquette at the same time. Yeah, because Doc Rivers went to Marquette. Keep the heads ringing. Yep, he was a Mark, yep, a Marquette Golden Eagle. And it would have been between the years of 1980 and 1983, so that's... Well, you know, but the in the Australian Open this past weekend that concluded, Yannick Sinner stunned Novak Djokovic in the semifinals in four sets, and also had to come back from two sets to none against Deni- Daniel Med- Medvedev to win the men's singles tournament. The women's event, the women's singles event, was won by Arena Sabalenka. And now that we've gotten through the the starting lineup, it is now time for the good, bad, and the ugly. All right, all right, all right. Uh, so we got our good for this week. Do you want to talk about yeah. that first, and then I'll get and our good the this bad week. And, ugly? and our good this week involves the NBA. As LeBron James and Stephen Curry were spearheading epic performances and both of them being the age of 35 or older in a double overtime thriller on the West Coast where the Lakers beat the Warriors 145 to 144. LeBron had 36 points, 20 boards, and 12 assists in a trip dub. And Stephen Curry had 46 on the on that night, including the one that initially put the Warriors ahead late in double overtime. And there were heroics back and forth between the between the two teams, and each of them having huge moments here and there. I didn't get to watch any of that game, but in really looking at a whole lot of it back, that one. That one right there, I mean, we had so many instant classics with those two about seven, eight years ago. And now this one is for the books as well. Yeah. And then we go along with, even though that was really good, I think our bad and our ugly are kind of the ones that we really got to scrutinize a lot more. What was not so good this week? And it involves my area. And the Washington Nationals deciding to retire their City Connect jerseys at the end of the 24 season and then also unveiling a monstrosity of uniform selection and then getting rid of the curly W that may 
may look a little too much like Walgreens logo. And for me, as long as you bring it back for like maybe like an alternate or like a reasonable alternate, okay, I could see you maybe getting away with this change. But when I looked at the uniforms as a whole, they look they look hideous. Well, it's a guy, so no, but they're no, but they're absolutely terrible. The block hmm. they look like, especially the road grays. They look like a generic high school jersey. What are you wearing, Jake from State Farm? Uh, uh khakis. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, she sounds hideous. Well, it's a curly <laughs> W, so like. No, but <laughs> oh well, they have the curly W on the on the sleeve, so they actually are keeping that that one. But the pullover jersey no longer has it at all, and they like they keep all the particular like logos, like all the letter logos. But the ensemble is a V neck pullover for the home jersey. An interlocking DC placed on the inside of the silhouette mark the District of Columbia on an arm patch. The road gray jerseys are with the Washington in, in tricolor block. The numbers on the front and back have blue outline with red text. And the names appear in red text on in a blue outline. Red and blue trim on the jerseys and pants been replaced in tricolor with red, white, and blue piping. The Cherry Blossom City Connect uniforms will be worn on Friday and Saturday home games, and they will be retired from regular wear after this season. The Nats Navy and white jerseys with the Nationals in script across the chest will also be worn again. So, I mean, it maybe maybe hideous isn't the most appropriate word for this. It might be, especially for the... Because the home jersey does look a little revolutionary, but severely underwhelming. But the away jersey does look like a generic high school uniform. Like, it's... There's nothing... There's nothing cool about it. There's nothing exciting. It's like Nike just took away all the excitement out of an MLB uniform. Nike has more excitement in their NFL uniforms than their MLB uniforms right now. And that and that to me is disappointing. I mean, the Marlins ones I did see didn't look horrid. But the national ones, to me, were just unimpressive. Yeah, I don't know much else to say about that one except for... I don't know. Um, But... Let me go... But the ugly the... is... But the downright ugly is really ugly. So, I'm going to have a, a visual from uh, the New York Times for this one. So, the statue of Jackie Robinson in a Kansas City Monarch jersey was removed at the ankles from a public park in Kansas City. Um, so, the authorities in Kansas are searching for the vandals who stole a life-size bronze statue commemorating Jackie Robinson. Um, after they cut off the ankles, leaving behind the statue's shoes at the base. Uh, the police in Wichita were notified of the theft around uh, 1 p.m. on Thursday after getting a call from League 42, the Little League nonprofit uh, that installed the statue at McAdams Park. Andrew Ford, a police spokesman, said on Saturday the statue weighed 100 pounds and didn't know what the motivation was. So, on the pod, 
I have a picture of what is left of the bronze statue. It's literally just two feet on a uh, surface, and uh, I don't yeah. know what the motivation is there. I'm guessing it's like a, ha-ha, we took your statue, now what are you going to do about it? kind of thing. I don't think it's a I don't think it's racially motivated or uh anything super nefarious. I just think that someone was trying to get attention. I don't think it was yeah. Yeah, it is it is a for whoever stole it, that is a horrid action. Yeah, no, no kidding. I mean, um, if it if it was racially motivated, that is that is just wrong. If it was a ha ha moment, we're not laughing because Jackie Robinson, just as a whole, his impact on the game of baseball. And the sport of baseball is more important and was deserved of such a statue. Like, granted that, yeah, Major League Baseball, you can't wear the number 42 universally. And they only wear, and they wear it on a particular day the entire year of April 15th. I mean, Jackie Robinson has made a huge impact. And if it was some Gen Zers that don't quite get it, they gonna learn today. Yeah, and I don't want to get into a huge debate whether or not it was motivated racially or not, but I just think it's downright ugly because, like you said, it's just bad, like, out of all the things you could have done, you didn't take the feet with it. Like, come on, man. Yeah, that uh, is. Kind of reminds me of, like, in the intro to The Simpsons where they take the head off of uh, the founder statue of Springfield at the very beginning yeah. of the show intro. That's all that reminds me of. Um, yeah. So... Now that we got that out of uh, the way, now we're going into the high heat. Uh, yep, and we are recapping both games of the NFL Championship Week where we have a question specifically for each team out of these four. The first game we will have was the first game of the day. Chief 17, Ravens 10. A lot of a lot of notable things in that game. Um, there was a lot of heated debate and a lot of conspiracy about oh the NFL's rigged. Where this was the game where it was one end of, one end of a conspiracy theory versus another end of a conspiracy theory. Of the Super Bowl colors logo logo colors versus the Taylor Swift conspiracy theory of how the NFL is going to try and make some money uh, or how they've generated revenue off of just Taylor Swift's presence being there. <laughs> but okay, Eugene Krabs, you can stop <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, overall, as far as that game, I believe that the Chiefs outdisciplined the Ravens the whole way. Why would Lamar Jackson throw a ball in triple coverage? And especially underthrow such a ball in triple coverage? God only knows. Well, and then Zay, the Flow side, and Zay uh, Flowers will have rookie had a bunch of rookie mistakes, and he will learn. But what you were saying, 
I was gonna say, I, I apparently someone on the Chiefs defense had the last name of Andrews and caught the ball, and it wasn't of the uniform of the, of the Ravens. <laughs> uh, that was so mean. Uh, and also didn't well, make any sense. Well, it was also intended. Well, that pass was intended for Isaiah Likely. And he oh. likely had no shot at getting that ball. <laughs> Got him. Shot fired. Boop barrel. Um, yeah. But the question involving the winner of this game and about this game for the Chiefs is how impactful was getting Travis Kelsey involved early and often in the passing game for the Chiefs wide receivers to be able to make big plays Really throughout, but more so late. Travis Kelsey had uh, had eleven targets was th- was targeted eleven times, caught all eleven. Target eleven times, caught all eleven. Had a hundred and sixteen rushing yard or receiving yards, and a touchdown. Though Two his touchdowns. longest was all. No, it was one. It was two. He got inside the pylon for the second one. I don't know what you're smoking. I saw two. It's one. It is one. Because Isaiah Pacheco had the other. So then, do they overturn it then? No, Isaiah Pacheco got it on the run. Well, there was two, because there was the one with Hamilton. And the score was, was 17 to 10. Yes, I know, Dingus. Uh, I was wondering if they called back the play then, and then Pacheco got the touchdown, is what I was asking. Yeah, they called back the one. Yeah, the one they had, they got. They called the one back due to. Uh, they called one back due to a hold. But. Uh... That was the one with Rice, too. Yeah, that was the, uh, no, the second one was, the second touchdown was Pacheco running the ball. You know what, I'm off, thinking off of the Bills Garford. game, my bad. Yeah, yeah, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're awful, <laughs> like, where are you at, Ruckus? I'm like, the score's only 17 to 10. That game against Buffalo was a higher scoring game. <laughs> Like there were only two touchdowns the whole game for the for the Chiefs. Um, but anyways, I, I think the uh, impact of you, Travis Kelsey being involved early really helped, uh, and also just in general the offense really helped. And uh, as far as getting a good start for the Chiefs, because it's been a it's not been a huge secret that the Chiefs uh, have been down by a shit ton of points. Like, I don't know, 24 to nothing before and come back. But sometimes that's not feasible when you're on the road and the whole crowd is against you and you're playing against the crowd noise. And we showed uh, the uh, home team who was boss like we did against the Bills last week granted we didn't beat the Bills by a whole lot but we built the we beat the Ravens by a little bit more but I think it definitely helped that Kelsey got going early and uh, Rice got there and the same with Pacheco but it also helped that we got that first stop uh, of the that first drive against the Ravens and we kind of silenced the haters a little bit when it came to, uh, and the announcers for that fact, of them being like, oh, we don't know if the defense is going to uh, hold up for the uh, against the Chiefs or whatever. And it's just like, well, we showed you out. Your best uh, corner, Hamilton, he got beat by the best tight end in the game currently in Travis Kelsey. And he's not even a corner! He's a safety, isn't he? Yep. Well, I don't know the Ravens that well, but I do know that Hamilton was a menace for most of the year, and 
my god, he got schooled. And then Zay Flowers was talking a little smack. I mean, well, who that wasn't was a, talking smack? That was a brilliant ball. The one that Kyle Hamilton ultimately gave up to Travis Kelsey, that was a beautiful ball and pretty much put in the only place that Kelsey would have been able to catch it. That and then the so, NES ball, too. The one where he, he caught it on his ass. That was well, interesting. Oh, yeah, there were... Yeah, I think that I think that getting Kelsey involved early helped I think settle down a a receiving unit that may not have had as much experience in these crucial Super Bowl on the line type of games. I mean, Rasheed Rice has not necessarily been playing like a rookie. He's been playing more like a two- or three-year vet. But at the same time, I think getting Kelsey involved did settle, like, would settle down any jitters. Uh, getting MVS, that big play late, like knowing that the Ravens were going to have to lock in on Travis Kelsey and focus on him. Yeah kind of open the open the doors for the receivers to be able to make the plays they needed to and also their sense of running the ball whenever they needed to with Pacheco more so Pacheco than CEH but that's neither here nor there yeah and the question we have for the Ravens is what do the Ravens need to do to put themselves in a better position to get over the hump and make a return trip to a Super Bowl eventually? Um, and uh, I'm gonna be frank here. Maybe not as many distractions. Um, number one, uh, the whole. I mean, yeah, Ray Lewis at the beginning was fine, but when you have T. Sizzle come out like more than halfway through the uh the game. Which is ironic because he also won a Super Bowl with the Chiefs. I just thought it was funny that he came out and he was like, Hey guys, I'm here! And then everybody else is like, shut up! <laughs> We're playing a game! And I was just like, wait, didn't he also win a Super Bowl with us? Oh yeah, he did! Um, that and then uh, more distractions when it came to uh, players getting cocky and uh, turnovers. Um... The rookies and just in general, the players on offense on the Ravens need to like have more ball control. Yes, Zay Flowers made a mistake getting having a fumble that le led to a touchback. Well, um, diving uh, the dive was the biggest mistake for him. And then he, um, he probably could have ran that and then been able to contort himself late to be able to get that touchdown. So I think that that was that was a little. That was a little dumb on their part. Also, on his part. Um, there were a lot of uh, big mistakes for uh, the Ravens. Oh, there, when there it were came a lot of to... yeah, there were a lot of discipline error, discipline errors, and um, shooting themselves in the foot. Interceptions, um, uh, galore. Um, well, it was really only the one interception with Dion Bush, but uh, you had. Ample of times to run the ball too. They didn't really run the ball. They mainly threw, and it kind of bit them in the butt. Um, yeah. But yeah, to get them over the hump, I think it's gonna need to be uh, more younger offensive talent and a little bit more defensive. Like feed both well, sides, but I think you need at least one more wide receiver because Odell Beckham isn't. Uh, I don't think. Uh, is uh your answer as your number one slot guy i think zay is gonna become that and then you try to get another like young guy or maybe trade for a uh a little bit more seasoned guy that doesn't have as much uh wear on his treads well here's where i am at i have said this before the, the formula that makes Lamar Jackson is you take Michael Vick and you subtract arm strength. 
He does not have the arm strength. You can add a little bit more on Lamar's accuracy, but I believe that the Chiefs took away the intermediate passing game. Lamar Jackson needed to go underneath more often than what he was accustomed to. Like, to look to look for the quick hitters rather than the stuff that is over, over in the intermediate range. Because he was not getting the intermediate range. You needed to... The playbook offensively needed to have more underneath passing. A little... Get a little more West Coast on that defense. And kind of throw more quick passes that are like, oh... Four yards, five yards, eight yards. You might get a 10-yarder off of some yak. And have more plays on the field to wear down the defense. I think that they made entirely too many mistakes there. I think that the discipline could be an improvement. I think that Baltimore is going to be losing, may lose a coach somewhere along the way, especially because there's still two head coaches that need to be hired. And the Ravens are one of those teams where interviews or interview candidates are available. Um, But along with that, I think that Lamar has to just continue to develop and grow. That is the only way that I think Lamar gets there. And also, I think really the other thing is, is teams also have to, the entire AFC as a whole has to, has to ultimately stump Mahomes enough to get him out, to get him beat and get him out. Because I believe, I believe at this point, is that for any other team other than Kansas City at this point to get to the Super Bowl, is to not is to make sure that they beat them and don't see him at all. Plain and simple. Stump Mahomes. Open up the open up the gates more for the AFC. Simple as that. All right, let's go into the NFC. And then into the NFC. The Niners won this game 34 to 31. Detroit started out with a huge start, commanding the entire game, having a 24, having a 24 to 7 lead at half. But the but the 49ers rally themselves back. A major fumble by Jameer Gibbs gave them a short field and put them more in position to get themselves ahead. But I believe that the Lions taking too many points off the board was what hurt them. Yeah, the Dan field Cam- goals. Yes, Dan happen. Campbell... Yes, Dan Campbell is an aggressive coach. The play call on fourth down to Josh Reynolds was solid and he dropped it. But that was also a situation where you would have been up three scores on a 46-yard field goal from Michael Badgley had he been able to make it to put yourself up 17 with about seven and a half to go in the third. And then also kicking the one in the fourth. But analytics, they were stuck in situations where analytics had that be as close to 50-50 as possible without being exact. The situation called for go for it by 0.3% on the first one and 0.2% on the second. So really, it was almost like you couldn't go wrong. Like it It was hard to go wrong in either situation. And Dan Campbell doesn't regret it. 
but and I think the MO is outside of a norm and a little countercultural to what normal fundamental NFL football is about in not taking points off the board. And taking points off the board is ultimately one of those things that frustrates anyone who watches football. Is why would you take the points off the board? And yes, even though ultimately the philosophy here is three is better than none, but seven is always better than three. I think Campbell just needed to know when to take the three and when to go for the seven. And I think in both of those situations, it was better for Dan Campbell to take the three or take a good opportunity at the three than than go for the seven. Your thoughts on that, Ruggis? Um, Yeah, pretty much you hit the nail on the head with the Lions. I think... They played a little. I think they played a little bit too headstrong when it came to like the thing, like the with the mistakes of not doing just a field goal to make play it safe. But at the same time, uh, when you're in that aspect of uh in the moment and whatnot, I think it's a lot harder to justify that when you're like, oh well, yeah, we should totally go for it. But at the same time, yeah. it's like, well, to play it safe, like. Sometimes playing it safe helps you get to winning a championship. The yeah. uh, Chiefs, for example, a couple say, of years ago uh, had that chance that they would have gone for a couple of field goals instead of trying to go for it at the uh, end half in the ASC championship game against the Bengals a couple of years ago, but they decided to go for it. It's just I mean, people could say hindsight is so four years ago, but but it all but ultimately hindsight is also perfect vision. I mean, also, it just, you don't want to try to repeat bad things in history, too, and repeat mistakes. Wow, that joke just sailed completely over your head. Uh, you're welcome. (laughs) It was was a 2020 reference. Yes, I know, you (laughs) jerk. Uh... Uh, but the question here on the 49ers is, did this game show further reason that Brock Purdy could not only be a franchise quarterback, but a championship quarterback for years to come? I mean, if you told me as a GM that I could have a franchise quarterback that's worth $800,000 a season for the next year or two, uh, and I could build a uh, talent around that man, and also, uh, pay the guys I currently have. I would have thought you were smoking something. But for them to have the luck that they've gotten with Mister Relevant Brock Purdy, I think speaks that um, you still need a talented quarterback. You can't just, like, put out a Joshua Dobbs like the Vikings did earlier in the season and then have him uh, not be the best there is or whatever you want to call it. Um, Speaks volumes. Because also the same thing happened with Nick Mullins. Nick Mullins could have been in the same boat, too. But I think this is a testament to the genius in the brainchild and brain craft that is the 49ers front office. I think it's lucky. this is a this is well, there's that too. Because because yeah, the, uh, the but the preparation that the 49ers had to be able to say, "Hey, we're going to draft this guy." He potentially is a long shot to make it, but we could give him a chance. But to be able to present themselves with the potential opportunity only to not realize what greatness they had in front of them through it, a little bit of luck had to be involved. But realize that there's also luck is preparation plus opportunity.
Yes, that is the simple formula for good favor and luck. Is preparation and opportunity. And I think there was a stroke of genius that had to come from the likes of John Lynch and Adam Peters, who now the commander's just got, to see if that will completely translate itself over. But there was something that the 49ers nailed in, in drafting this quarterback from Iowa State. It's like they had it's like they had the golden ticket and didn't even realize it until they run, had to Charlie, put him in. Run! Run! <laughs> Sorry, that uh that uh triggered me a little bit when you said uh the golden ticket. Golden just, ticket. I've yeah, got a golden but... ticket. <laughs> I don't think you no, can you hear don't. the whistle, no, but, you know. No you don't. You've got a jar of dirt. You've got a jar of dirt. Guess what? Hey, don't, <laughs> hey, don't, don't, don't be hating on Jack Sparrow like that, my guy. Dude, he'd be. Oh, dude, there was no wondering. hating he, on. He was there was always, no hating on Jack Sparrow. <laughs> why is all the rum gone? Why is it always gone? Oh, it's apparently because you're <laughs> always keeps well, drinking it. I'm pretty sure it's Gibbs that always drinks it, though. <laughs> but, but it, digression aside, <laughs> I think that it, it's just I think the 49ers had had themselves a a eureka moment, like throughout the throughout this two year stretch. It's like as if the 49ers just had a eureka moment. And in a parallel to their actual name and where it comes from, they struck gold. Simple, simple as that. Now, as for the Lions, what is the biggest takeaway from this season about them? hard just headstrong uh foaming at the mouth uh looking to show your team up no matter how talented it is um defense with Aiden Hutchinson uh that man can will run through a brick wall to try to get at your quarterback um oh you have a coach that you have a coach that you that it is very for any football player or let alone any person to buy in. So Dan Camp so Dan Campbell is an incredible coach. Hell of a, a coach. very a very aggressive coach and probably will be the NFL coach of the year. Um Um also the Porta on the other side the draft, with the with draft Omar. class. The draft class from this year was another one where the the Lions hit a gold mine. They they hit a very synergistic gold mine in getting Jameer Gibbs, Jack Campbell, Sam Laporta, Brian Branch. All four of those rookies made major impacts in just their first season of play. As a front office, you couldn't be any happier about that. And there are just specific players that Dan Campbell wants in a team. And they... And, and Dan Campbell will figure out what they need to do to get them. I mean, to uh, pretty much uh, put the nail on the head there, um, like I was going to say before you kind of took over. Um, oh, the, the ceiling the offense, for them is the, off, the offense hot. is 
has exploded. You had Jameer Gibbs, which was an unknown because he just got drafted. Um, Almond Ross St. Brown has been uh, yes and no. You had... Um, no, Amon Jameson. Ross St. Brown has been a model of consistency. Can I please that- uh, finish? Yeah. Um, Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, like last year, was kind of inconsistent, but this year was very good. You had Jamison Williams, which had a very um, rough start to his career. Number one, he had that torn ACL and then kind of played a little bit last season. This season, he had a little bit of a setback because of uh, gambling um, and then came back and did some uh, wonders. And then another running back that they didn't have last season and David Montgomery really helped solidify that running game too, not just Jameer Gibbs. So I think the overall offense has exploded. Like, it took what the Chiefs had and um, accelerated it a little bit more to compared to what the Chiefs had. Developed the offensive line. Added a second, added two running backs that were able to run the ball extremely well. Pretty much... Got another great year from a receiver who, when on the field, has been a model of consistency in Amon Ross St. Brown and added a great performing tight end on the receiving and blocking end in Sam Laporta. You've got Jamison William you've got Jamison Williams who has figured out a little bit more of what his climb looks like, Josh Reynolds. I think you I think the Lions get another wide receiver in the draft. Maybe not early, but another like wide receiver in the draft. Yeah, I could even say maybe even a fourth round wide receiver that that could be at least a reasonable pick. Um I think I think mostly for the Lions, the ceiling is high. And really, they're one of those teams where the core is young just kind of solidify with depth pieces that that you could find here or there that make sense. And the and the Lions do a great job of now drafting for what they can do to have it make sense. So I think the so I think the future for the Lions is Kind of like how it's been the last couple of years, only much brighter. It's just a matter of can the Lions get back there. I like With, the D, uh, MCDC's quote after the post game, though, as well. He said he didn't know if they were going to ever get back to the Super Bowl, but he was also saying that he wasn't going to. Um, discount what uh, his guys did as well I think exactly exactly that is the right thing to say for that you don't discount this season at all oh yeah because they now get the first place schedule the first place divisional schedule which includes the Dallas Cowboys the San Francisco 49ers and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Along with the along with the other AFC team that they have to face. So that so that's huge. Those are huge things that the Lions definitely had to consider for next year. And it's going to be exciting like it's going to be exciting to see where they go from here and whether they can sustain what they've done what they've done this year into the very next season. We have no film room this week. So we are going to go straight into the color commentary where we now talk about some coaching things. And we will say good hire or bad hire. All right. 
the first one here is the Raiders in retaining or removing the interim tag of Antonio Pierce. Good hire or bad hire? I think it's very good for the Raiders just because he has the uh, back of his uh, players and the players uh, understand the mentality and uh, the expectation that it is for next season for uh, Raider Nation. So I think this is a good hire. I think this is a good hire as well. I believe that the Raiders have now found a way or found a coach that the players can buy into. And if this goes in the same direction or with within the same trajectory as what Dan Campbell has done in Detroit, the only thing I have to tell you, Ruckus, as a Chiefs fan, is look out. I that think is the the defense that is the speaks only... louder than words over there in Raider Nation. Yeah, but still, I'm gonna say the only the biggest difference is is that yeah, offensively, Dan Campbell would know his stuff there with that because he's a tight end. But I wouldn't be surprised then if Ben Johnson gets hired for a coaching spot. And the Ravens get some hires as well, as far as those. So you'll see some changes there. But Antonio Pierce staying in Oakland, the reason why I said that's possibly a lookout is because if it goes like that, it'll be it it's gonna be scary playing Vegas twice a year. I'll see it when I believe it. Um next well, one. The only thing I have to say is just give it time. And I don't know. I don't think. I mean, I don't think Pierce will be able to do that in three years. But I bet. But we were wrong about Dan Campbell before. (laughs) The second one here, we're going to stay in the AFC West and go with the L.A. Chargers hiring Jim Harbaugh. But they put the coach before the GM. Good hire or bad hire? Um, I think you need a uh, head coach first versus a uh, GM hire, especially if you're uh, trying to, if you already cleaned house already and you don't know who to trust. I think the hire for a head coach first was probably one of the better ones, but I think it was a good idea for the Chargers to... Uh, sign Jim Harbaugh as their head coach because yes he has work to do with the uh, the Chargers but he also has the experience of actually coaching a damn NFL team unlike Staley that just looks stale out there um we'll see what happens with their GM search but they in general just have a lot of money to figure out and stuff like that so it's gonna be a bit tougher for the Chargers just to be like oh you want to be a GM? All right, can you shuffle around this money? You can? Well, get out. Like, I don't know. Anyways, Jim Harbaugh was a good hire. I'm going to say right hire, wrong time. Right hire. It it's it's a good hire, but I would have but unlike the Commanders who who went GM coach who went GM and are still pursuing a coach I think the Chargers got this backwards I think your GM needed to be hired first to kind of to be able to set where like to kind of really set themselves and kind of give themselves a better direction you're, you've now got a coach with a GM with no vision, or with a GM that doesn't quite have his vision yet. So it's like a coach is kind of going into this a little bit blind. So I think it, I think that although Harbaugh has the capabilities to be able to do this right, 
I still think a GM before the coach was probably the way that that should have been done. And I think the commanders ultimately were the one team that had the GM coach and coach higher need. And they were the ones that got it right. Next up, the New England Patriots promoting Gerard Mayo to become their head coach. Good hire or bad hire? I think it's good because it's good to promote the internal uh, coaches depending on how well they're received, but also just in general, like, I'm pretty sure he was going to be the next man up either way in that uh, Belichick tree when it came to all that, so I think it was good to keep that uh, rhythm alive in the uh, Patriot Nation. I think it was smart. I think that I think that them going with Gerard Mayo might have been the right idea. And it's also good coaching or at least normally the solid coaching will come from line, like especially in terms of defensive specialties. Is Gerard May like Gerard Mayo was a linebacker? And in Gerard Mayo's career, he also was a New England Patriot through and through. Played his entire career as a member of the Patriots. So that organization is also the only one he knows. So the Patriot way is still and still still brought in. It's just now another face behind it and a different a different face that could be that is younger and more relatable this is also kind of very similar to what D'Amico Ryan's had with Tex with Houston I think this could be the one situation that may turn out like that but I think that the division that he is in is also extremely difficult because you have Miami with Mike McDaniel and his revolutionary style of offense. You've got Buffalo with Josh Allen and a good defense and a good defense. And you have the Jets who are kind of a weird fluttering of really really good or really really bad. <laughs> And now to the Falcons. Hiring the Rams defensive coordinator Raheem Morris. Who has coaching experience before. And taking Raheem Morris over a Bill Belichick. Good hire or bad hire? Um, Probably good if uh, he's... If it turns out that he's better than uh, Artie Smith, with or without the mustache, so <laughs> I'm gonna say good. I think this is a hire that is very much dependent upon the defensive personnel that he has and what he can do with them. And and how his defensive playbook kind of fits that Atlanta defense. It's I think it's too dependent on that. I think this could be a bad hire. I think that Atlanta I mean not to saying that Artie Smith is better. I just think that Raheem Morris may or may not be the the right the right coach to have for that situation. Granted that it is in a with a very patient owner Arthur Blank and a in, in a division where it seems like it's a crapshoot every time for who ultimately wants to be at the top. 
The next head coach is also in the South and will actually go to the NFC South, stay in the NFC South. And the Carolina Panthers hiring Dave Canales, the Tampa Bay offensive coordinator. But the Panthers also have not hired a GM yet. Is Dave Canales good hire or bad hire? For a second, I almost read that as cannolis. I don't know why. Um, um, I think he'll be probably better, but I'm not entirely sure. So I'm going to say he's in the middle. I think this is bad. I think this is probably the... It's probably a good offensive fit. But I think that the Panthers have so much wrong. There, there is so much wrong with things in Carolina that I think hiring Dave Canales before the GM may not have been the good, may not have been the best fix to solve it. Because I think that Carolina just their lack of a first round pick and mortgaging that off to the Bears was probably the worst decision that they could have made. And that, I think, and because Dave Canales does not have that, and he now has to deal with Bryce Young, who did not have the best rookie year, and is now going to his second head coach and second style of offense, I think it remains to be seen if Dave Canales can put Bryce Young in a position offensively to develop as well as he did a Baker Mayfield. I was about to say, uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, the time that Baker had, like, what, two head coaches in a span of, like, a couple of years, right? Or was it more like three? I mean, I think he, think he might have dealt with Freddie Kitchens and then Kevin Stefanski. Or he also went from team to team for a good bit, too. Well, wasn't there also another uh, coach, too, like Paul Brown? Or or actually, no, not Paul Brown. What was the other? Mike Brown, maybe? Because wasn't Kitchens a white dude? Yes. Oh, it was Hugh Jackson. It would have been Hugh yeah, Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That... Hugh Jackson and Freddie Kit. It, it, I don't know if that was the same year that Baker Mayfield was a rookie or not. I just remember... Might have been the Hugh Jackson, Hugh Jackson, Freddie Kitchens. Yeah, Hugh Jackson, Freddie Kitchens. Uh, Kevin Stefanski. I just remember there was something like that uh, where uh, I think it was Tyrod Taylor was the uh, was the starter that year, and then they went to Baker afterwards. Okay. Yeah. But the next major hire we're going to talk about here. And this is the last head coach we're going to speak on. The Tennessee Titans hiring Brian Callahan, the Cincinnati Bengals offensive coordinator. Good hire or bad hire? Um, was Vrabel a offensive coordinator before he became a, a um, head coach? Or what no. was his status? No. Uh, Mike Vrabel? Mike Vrabel... He was a he was a former linebacker. Right. I just didn't know if he had any coaching experience before he decided to go coaching or if the Titans were Yes, he players. was in twenty eleven Vrabel in twenty eleven Vrabel was a linebackers coach at Ohio, at the Ohio State University. Okay. Moved up moved over to defensive line. Became a linebackers coach at Houston, and then moved up to defensive coordinator before taking the Titans job. Okay. That was the question I asked. Thank you. Um, 
So, I feel like this could be like a reverse of that, couldn't it? Where it's instead of a defensive coordinator to a head coach, it would be offensive coordinator. Yeah, to a it's head a shift. Coach. It's a shift in yeah. It's a it's a mindset shift, which so is, is a, generally oh. what you what you commonly will see between during head coaching changes like that. Wouldn't this be kind of normal... like what happened to Brian Flores too, where he was a offensive minded coach and then went to Oh, Brian Flores was coach. defense. Oh, I thought he was also on offense too, but anyway. Oh, he was a de- he was a defensive guy. I believe Brian Flores is a defensive coordinator. Brian Flores. Yeah, he is a he is currently the defensive coordinator with the Minnesota Vikings. Yep. Uh was a special teams assistant in New England, then went to offense and special teams coach, defensive assistant, safeties coach, linebackers coach, then head coach Miami, then went to Pittsburgh as a senior defensive assistant linebackers coach, and then now is the defensive coordinator for Minnesota. So most of his career has been on defense. Yep. Uh, so anyways... I don't. I think Brian Callahan for the Titans is probably a good thing, especially since their offense was absolute garbage for most of the season. In terms of getting himself a quarterback or finding himself looking at the quarterback room and being able to make a definitive decision on where the Titans do need to go at quarterback... I do think that this is a great hire. As Brian Callahan did develop, did help in the development of Joe Burrow. However, it is heavily dependent on who, who and, and what style is brought about on the other side of the ball. And whether or not the Titans choose to retain Derrick Henry. That is, I think, the key that separates this from being a good hire with a lot of question mark with a whole bunch of question marks to a great hire with very few. Because there are too many uncertainties with what Tennessee needs or could do that make this a lot less certain. Yeah. And now to our coordinator hires and our biggest key coordinator hires are Philadelphia. Picking up the picking up another offensive coordinator from the Chargers in Kellen Moore and a defensive coordinator from the Miami Dolphins in Vic Fangio. We're going to kind of go through these one at a time. And which one would you prefer to start with, defense or offense? Defense. All right, let's start with defense. Good hire or bad hire? Good. Better than Matt Patricia. That's all I'm going to say about that. Just very good at defense, knows it very well. Did very well with the Dolphins' defense as well. It was just that the Dolphins' defense was really beat up this year near the end. And I think Vic Fangio had a foundation also with how certain things in the Denver defense developed before he got fired. Yeah. And Vic Fangio, if he's if he knows one thing or has kind of been a notable person for something, he has been notable, and I've seen videos on this, of coming up with the defenses that bring the ultimate checks to the passing to to the passing ties of quarterbacks. Vic Fangio's defense 
has a lot of cover six and cover nine, which are kind of those two defenses that are very, very difficult to to throw on. Because you see one side of like one side is a cover two fit and the other side is a cover four fit. That's why it's a cover six. That cover six flipped the other way is a cover nine. So with Vic Fangio bringing a lot of cover six and cover nine, or at least the elements of that, Fangio's hire becomes great if the defensive personnel is able to fit the mold of which Fangio has. Now, Kellen Moore, on the other hand, I'm going to shift over to the offense and transition us. Kellen okay. Moore, on the other hand, is a very, very questionable hire. I mean, Kellen when you Moore, said that he came from the Chargers, that's a very questionable thing, too, because their offense has been ass, like, the past couple of years. And the only well, thing that really think also, up... prior to him even being with the Chargers, Kellen Moore was with the Cowboys. Ooh. Kellen Moore was a longtime offensive coordinator for the Dallas Cowboys, gets, gets yeeted out of there, goes to the Chargers. Justin Herbert isn't even the same. He, he was more cold like Sherbert instead of actually being Justin Herbert. And, and just ultimately... The end result is he's now in Philadelphia, now with Jalen Hurts at quarterback. I think that I I think that that is more destructive for the Eagles than constructive. Yeah. Because I don't think that Kellen Moore truly has an offense that I think tailors very well to this person. And, and it's a lot of throwing the ball deep for which he had Prescott and he had Herbert who both had like very, very electric arms. Yeah. Jalen Hurts is not that. Yes, Jalen Hurts is not that. Jalen Hurts is a little more of that versatile dual threat. And Jalen Hurts also knows how to run the dual threat wisely. And knows when to use it. I don't think that Kellen Moore has the right coaching tools for that. Yeah. Especially because his offense is a little more vertical. Okay. Uh, are we ready for our last part of the episode? The yep, the stun dud. dud. Yep. And I will let Ruckus have his usual go All right. first. All right. So I'm going to start with my dud this week, and that is Kadarius Tony, because during his IG live earlier this uh, week before the AFC Championship game, he was saying that uh, the intro report for the Chiefs from him was, as the kids say, cap. That he was um, not actually injured and the Chiefs were just holding him back. Um, and if you don't know what cap means in the grand scheme of things, it means bull crap. <laughs> like, when someone says no cap, that means no bull crap. But, yeah. Anyways, that's the PG-13 version of uh, that slang term. Um, and then my stud for the week is Travis Kelsey passing Jerry, Jerry Rice on touchdown uh, receptions from a... Uh, was it the same quarterback or just playoff? Wasn't it, wasn't playoff it also play total receptions? I thought I, he also had total receptions. I think it was. I think it was total receptions. Uh, Travis Kelsey breaks Jerry Rice's record for most postseason receptions. Yeah, that's total receptions, not touchdowns. 
Uh, anyways. Yeah, so T. Kelsey again with that dub, with that stud. All right, Spenis. All right, and here we go. My, and I am going to start in saying that a common theme with my honorable mention for my dud and my stud this week are public address announcers or public address teams and stadium personnel understanding the assignment. The question here, Ruckus, which one do you want first? The hit or the miss? Um, I want the miss. The miss? The miss is my honorable mention for the dud. And that is the San Francisco 49ers public address. Kind of misfiring on the person hurt during a collision. They played the Sonic the Hedgehog ring sound effect as if he would get hit by an enemy attack. The And it was Dre Greenlaw that was shaken up on the collision, not Sam Laporta. Even though the result of the play ended up becoming fourth down for the Lions, which may have been a logical reason, but the person who was actually hurt was Dre Greenlaw, not Laporta. (laughs) And Greenlaw had a stinger on the play. And that collision was like as if a freight train hit a brick wall and the brick wall won. And then, to my actual stud, this is the hit. The San Antonio Spurs public address announce team and their stadium effects for how they handled a bat that flew into the arena. So, San Antonio's mascot. Is, is the coyote. So coyote is coming out to catch this bat. Let alone there's a bat, bat flying around the stadium. But coyote is in a Batman costume. And so on top of that, somebody understood the assignment. And they played the Adam West 60s Batman theme song as the coyote is getting sauced up by this bat and eventually catches him. So the coyote ultimately caught it. But the Batman but the Batman music was going on in the background. <laughs> the background and and just understanding the assignment and the context of the situation is why I give the San Antonio Spurs public address announce team that stud. But my actual dud goes to Ravens rookie wide receiver Zay Flowers. Yes, granted that this was a rookie mistake. There was a rookie mistake involving taunting, There was a rookie mistake involving the fumble. But the issue was more so the fumble with the fumble was what he did afterward. The man goes on the sideline and he cuts his hand on the bench, probably from punching it, after giving up the fumble that resulted in the touchback. little bit of a maturity thing. Granted, nobody didn't get flagged for it or anything else, but it was just like, why? Was that necessary? It was like Amari Stoudemire, I think, breaking his hand on a fire hydrant years ago. Yep. 
All right. You ready to uh for me to take Yep, us out? go ahead and take us out. But before I do that, I want to say thank you for the recent support uh the uh past little bit. Uh we are now at 23 current subscribers in the last 28 days according to the channel analytics and we are up to 87 views in the past 28 days as well with our watch time hours being 11.7 which is not bad at all the sherbert versus mr mustard ruckus super bowl 58 uh super bowl race video got up to 10 views um the do or die ended up with 14 and then the last episode before this one got seven views we're doing pretty damn good for a uh, podcast that has not very much as far as subs and not very much as far as uh, just, like, starting out. I mean, yeah, we've been around here for about a year and some change, but it's about to become year two here before you know it, and it's crazy how time flies but my god i am thankful for what we are at the uh uh situation we're at now um and i thank you guys for uh listening and leave a like if you like this video and um also uh this is a rux in the mist sports production thank you for watching and is there anything you also have to add to that spenis no we are good super bowl predictions will be next week and we will probably be figuring out some other special super bowl related things to throw into the episode so i'm sure that some of them may end up being could be a repeat of the previous previous year because i didn't i didn't track the list of anything but I am very sure that we will figure out something that was kind of unique or something fresh to kind of bring in for the Super Bowl. We'll see you later. Deuces.